Yes. Our historical tour yes. of the Spring yes. Cemetery yes. and our very last tour. Yes. 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 yes, that's how I found out about the Valley Western. Yes. 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 Tell me about the, the audio system that he came up with. I'm probably yeah. looking and you were yeah, at this it right is, there. Uh, well, this is actually, these are these are uh, records that came from movie producers. Okay. So, uh, you know, back in the early talkies, they didn't have sound on film. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. And so they had to somehow synchronize the sound to the films. So this is, this is a record that was typical at the time. It's 16 inches in diameter. It's uh, it played at 33 RPM, and it's basically one reel of time, which is 12 minutes. So what you have to do is get this synchronized with the projector going over here, and that's... Well, were there time cues, vi uh, visual time cues? Uh, that, that, yeah. that, and was yeah. there maybe a click or something yeah, on, on the record? The time cue here is there's a little mark that says, start. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and so... What they would do is they would position the needle here, and this, these, these records play backwards, you might say. They play from the inside out, really, not from the outside in. Okay. So you put the needle here, and then you, you line up the film over here, and then you turn the motor on. Uh, Western Electric had developed some of the technology early in the days, and there was a... So my grandfather wanted to have a system that was more economical and easier to use for the projections. Uh, so he developed this system called a camera phone. And there's, there's six different models. Um, this is really interesting. <laughs> I can find it for you. Anyway, <laughs> the, um, there was the, the ones that were driven directly off of the shaft of the projector. So it would be synchronized by virtue of the projector speed versus... At gear, least some way gear. to match up, yeah. Right. But one of the issues there was the motors and the projectors weren't exactly all synchronous. They were sometimes out of sync and you would get a little bit of fluctuation. And, and was so it a chain drive, a belt drive from that motor? This was a direct... Direct shaft. Direct shaft. Drive. Okay. So we had two versions. The tall version, in case your projector was mounted high in the, in the projection motor, or a low version if it was low mounted. And then he also had a motor driven one that the motor, your motor would drive the projector and the record together. So you were then in control of the motor ah. yourself. Mm -hmm. And so there was different models of the upper and lower and then the motor driven. So you can get the deluxe one, which is you know, <laughs> the acme of perfection. <laughs> heavy duty, with a heavy duty motor and you know, all refined components. So he didn't invent the sound system. They were still using the the distributor or the filmmaker's audio source, the record. Yeah. He just invented he, a way to sync. To synchronize. Okay. And then do I see a vertical no, that's record? Just, that's I, just, that's okay. just dis display. Okay. Although he did, he did have a, an option from the record version to, to, the, to the theaters that didn't have a sound uh, projector. So there was an appliance you could add to the projector which would read the sound from the film if you bought a film from the movie house mm -hmm. and use that apparatus with the lights and the receivers and uh, all the bells and whistles to actually read the sound and then connect it to your sound. And that would have been an optical audio track. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, don't, I don't have any record of sound any of these, but I, I have found correspondence where he sold several of these in the state of Florida. Uh, these are copies of the uh, actual flyers he would send out to prospective clients promoting the camera phone. So this one was about eight pages, and they were the fold-out style. So it was uh, easy. He would fold it in half or thirds, and then mail it out. Oh, I put a stamp on it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's you know promoting the, the camera phone. You know, of course, everything's very attractive. You know, bring a man ahead ahead of its time. Um, of course, a picture of the studio where it was the, the uh, engineers developed this material and then the different models. What's interesting about this promotional process is not only was promoting this, the camera phone as something you need for your theater house, but since you need it, you also need everything that goes with it. Amplifiers, 
rectifiers, voltage control. He, got, he can get speakers, <laughs> all kinds of speakers, depending on what size your theater is. You can get a turntable, you can get a, a nice side table unit. And, and you can also buy the records. If you need records and like background mm -hmm. sound or maybe even a train coming by, it's a dollar fifty each. Everything you could ever need to help set up the, the camera phone and make it a, make it the talkies work, even a place to store to store the records. And if you're really gonna be adventuresome, you need to have a truck. <laughs> He'd sell you a truck. No, he would no. let you furnish your own truck, but he would outfit it so it had the speakers inside. So you're going to drive down Main Street of town, and you're going to promote your activity, whatever it is. But let's say you're a car salesman or the, 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 the local general store. So Politicians did that too on the elections. Yeah. So you, you, inside it, you would put a, a, a turntable that had a record that you could play music or some kind of background banner. And then you also can outfit the driver with a hands-free microphone. So he wear the microphone around his neck, and then he could click it and, and advertise. Now you sometimes see this sort of thing depicted in circus movies. Yeah. You know, where the advance man comes oh, into yeah. town yeah. and promotes and that's the what they circus. Did. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would come into town a week ahead of time, or sometimes like the day or two ahead of time to, to paste on the the, the barns and the buildings, mm -hmm. the, the advertisements. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. think I mean, you sound like you want to sell these things. <laughs> Why not? I, look, for a mere $500, you can start and get into the business. Increase your business. It says right here. If you could only find one to sell. That's right. If it's, year, it's years ahead of its time. One of the things that, um, that uh, I guess is in a way unique is that if you, if you go to the property, you're going to see the five buildings. You see the, the production building where they edited the films and uh, did the, did the you know, production of the finished product. Uh, and, and as was common back in those days, the business was downstairs. They lived upstairs. Mm -hmm. So that's where my grandmother and grandfather lived and my father lived when he was younger. And eventually, uh, in the late 29 to 32, uh, his mother, uh, mother, we call Mother Norman, uh, Mother uh, Catherine Bruce Norman, lived there with them. Uh, so when, when uh, after the war, you know, my dad married uh, my mom, she's from Albany, Georgia, and they moved down back to the house in uh, Jacksonville. And they lived in the, the small, what we call the small house, which uh, was, in terms of the property, is, is the, the, uh, the dressing room or the cottage where the actors and actresses would, would uh, change during movie days. So there was the garage, which was full of all kind of props and paraphernalia. There was a make, makeshift airstream back in the corner. Uh, I remember seeing the, the uh, airplane engine and a big propeller in the garage. Uh, and also on the property was the, the power house where they generated electricity back in the early days when there was no power out in the Arlington area. So that's, they had to generate the electricity for the, for the set building. So the, the set building, uh, which is now uh, belongs to the Circle of the Church, uh, was where they had uh, the sets for movies or for commercial advertisements that they, they did later. Uh, after the, the movie era ended, my grandmother started teaching tap dancing in the, the, the theater. And uh, the story from my father uh, relays that when my grandfather was out of town, distributing movies or, or uh, promoting his movies, she would have people come upstairs to teach him ballroom dancing. So when he came back 
to Jacksonville and trying to get work done. They're upstairs banging on the floor. So he he converted the the theater of this production building for them into a studio. But so you actually lived in the building? Yeah, we, uh, we lived, um, my older sister, my older brother and myself lived in the little house, which is the cottage, uh, from 1950, uh, I was, excuse me, I was born in 1950, and they moved there, and my mom and dad moved there about 47. They were, they were married in 45. So my older sister and brother were there and when I was born in 50. We all lived there until about 1955. And uh, I find memories of the, of the of little house. It was basically one big living room and uh, one bathroom, three kids and two adults. And it didn't work out too well all the time, <laughs> but uh, we had fun, yeah. So I go back there now and I can kind of remember and see what it looks like in my mind. Uh, there's the, there was, a port, there was a porch on the front and a porch on the back. It's not there now. But uh, in the restoration process, the original building did not have a, a porch in the front and back. And you'll see the you'll see that building in the front of Junction. Junction. Junction Gumption something. Lunch. Junction Lunch. Yeah, yeah Junction, Junction Lunch. lunch yeah. Yeah. When, when did you actually take an interest in preserving? as much as you could. Sometimes, you know, kids go off and do their own thing and they don't appreciate it until later. Yeah, well, the, the, you know, we, even though we lived in Tallahassee, uh, my grandmother was in Jacksonville. Uh, excuse me, I was in school in Tallahassee. We, we moved, my wife and I moved there in 75. We would go over and visit my grandmother and we knew she had all this material there. And, and when, they had the, when they had the auction, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure of the year, but it was, it was in the late 70s. Um, I just started realizing the amount of materials that were there. And uh, my dad had collected everything. And he moved my grandmother down to Hollywood, Florida. And then when he moved from Hollywood, Florida to Tallahassee, which is where we live, it all resided up there. So we had a, an armed link interest in the materials uh, over time, but then as my dad's health declined and uh, after he passed away, we, we took the materials and wanted to make sure that they were uh, in a safe place, in a controlled environment, and uh, eventually cataloged them so that we could help preserve them for future use. Uh, and the, the primary goal is to help Norman Studios organization in Jacksonville who is trying to preserve the property and continue a legacy there so that we can transport that material to them and uh, have a working museum. So you're excited about what might happen? Oh yes, definitely. Every time I come across something, I come across even looking for more stuff on the camera phone. It's just amazing at the amount of material that exists, both uh, that we have as a family and also what is available at the Indiana University and the Library of Congress. And there's also things that were distributed out from the family. Uh, Dean Autry Museum has one of my grandfather's original cameras that he used. Uh, and they also have the, the over-under pistol that Bill Pickett used to put down his, put down his cane. Remember he pulled that long? It was a pistol. That's not legal, but uh, that was well, donated that. to the, yes. the uh, Autry Museum in California. Why do you think you're, you know, Given the race relations we have, given the, the, the way things are in our country today, and then looking at the 20s and 30s. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a different time, uh, but in a way, um, not di much different than today. You know, the, first of all, I think my grandfather's interest was in promoting movies. But he, there was a niche that started developing in that period of time, uh, what they call race films. So, uh, and he didn't, uh, my understanding is in some correspondence I've seen, he didn't really appreciate the way the race films had been portrayed. It was too much what they call step and fetch. Mm. And so he decided that he wanted to produce a movie that would show the, the African American people in roles that people normally thought of only white people. 
And so he did that. And uh, he was very successful at it. But that whole market went up and back down and finally just disappeared. You must have a great sense of pride, though, about all of that. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I, I can't tell you what uh, feelings I felt when I, I came across a letter, which I don't, I don't have here, but there was a magazine, in, a trade magazine, I think it was in, let's say, Chicago area, I'm not sure, and he was re replying to an to a editorial they had written, and he basically replied and outlined exactly his thoughts on what should happen with race films and how they should uh, be produced and perceived. And it was very, it was very uplifting. And it showed how he felt in his heart about, about that whole process and the relations, uh, the, how they were being presented in the race films. He felt it should have been more positive than it, than it was by other producers.